Buddy Rock Dude here. And Mark Z, and welcome to another uh, episode of The Rockin' House in Season 2. We have a special guest here on The Rockin', Rockin House. House. going to be Rick Fox. Rick Fox played with Steeler, which originally had a guitar player, Yngwie. Uh, Sin was another band. He also was in the beginning stages of Wasp with Blackie Lawless, but... Rock Dude will tell you some more yeah, history well, about this guy. He's done a lot of things. Rick Fox has been around for a long time. Started as a rock and roll photographer in uh, yep. all the key locations, uh, CBGBs, uh, etc., in in uh, downtown Manhattan. But he became the bass player we know of him today. Played in Steeler. He was, did all the demo uh, recordings for the original Wasp band. And uh, he's, he played in Steeler with uh, Malins Dean and another great guitar player you should look up, Mitch Perry. One of the best. He has resume, uh, can prove all of that. So Mitch Perry and Malins Dean and Ron Keel were involved with the Steeler uh, band. Steeler band. Yes. So yeah, it's a great place to be uh, in music circles. Uh, Rick Fox is going to be on the show today and he has uh, notions of... Uh, he already had the reunion over in, at a club in Ohio for the uh, Steeler Band with, uh, featuring Ryan Keel and uh, Mitch Perry. Correct. Yep. And uh, he's going to go to a uh, major industry convention coming up with all his uh, A-list buddies. And uh, yep. there's talk of uh, Ryan Keel doing a project with Rick and uh, how cool would that be. Yes. So, uh, terrific bass player with tons of history. Um, it just seemed like he's been in the right place in history when he needed to be. So, yep. um, go ahead, Mark. I said we bring him on. Let's bring on Rick Fox to the Rockin' House and let's hear his story. That's amazing when you hear these stories that he has to tell. Welcome, Rick Fox, to the Rockin' House, brother. All right, this is Mark Z, my partner, Rock Dude, and welcome to season two and another awesome episode. Of the Rockin' House, the special guest I have today is Rick Fox. Rick Fox played in Steeler. He even played, I think, involved with Talos, I think you said. Uh, of course, he, he played with Ron Keel and so many other projects. Rick, I want to say welcome to the Rockin' House. We're glad to have you on the show to talk about all these great things that you've done in your life and your career in music. Thanks for having me, guys. Awesome, man. Awesome, brother. Let's start the show, Rick, with... Uh, you know, how things started for you. You know, did you always start as a bass player? Were you a guitar player? Maybe you played a trumpet? I mean, you'd be surprised the stories I have heard. <laughs> uh, well, like I said earlier, it all started when I was born, and then I moved on. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you know, in this, I grew up at a, at a really great time in music. Right. Uh, it, you know, in the 60s, music was, uh, you know, I was born in the 50s, but music in the 60s was was fantastic all you know old, old manner of genre of music was hitting the radio you know first it was all on am yep you know in new york city and you had wmca wabc and you know like that cousin brucey and all of that yep. and you know and it was beatles in the 60s and then rolling stones and then you know started to fan out from there um you know uh, i got into uh into the 70s i got into stuff that was heavier and um, I, I, at first I started out listening to Gary Puckett and the Union Gap. I remember that. You know, yeah. they, they, he was like the big crooner, you know, but when you look at them on the album covers, they, these guys look so cool. They look like a gang. They're all wearing Civil War uniforms. <laughs> you know, they, they look like they belong together, you know, and, and True. I was having a conversation with some people about this recently. If you really listen to the lyrics, I mean, they didn't write a lot of their own stuff. It was right. all written for them. Right. But a lot of the lyrics are like, Nowadays would be like uh, considered uh, almost pedophilic, oh you know, God, older yeah. guy, younger girl kind of stuff, you know, yeah. young girl, and woman, woman, and you know, uh, stuff that that women who are home by themselves while the husbands aren't working, they're listening to this stuff, getting ideas, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it was it was kind of pushing the envelope lyrically. I mean, okay. I'm surprised that stuff got on the radio is so suggestive. But uh, after after the Union Gap, uh, uh, Gary Puckett and Union Gap. Um, the first two albums that was ever I bought for me, uh, my cousin got me in in uh, my birthday in 1968 was uh, uh, Beatles Rubber Soul, okay, and the first the first Steppenwolf album which had just come out. Nice, okay. And I gravitate. I love the Beatles, but I gravitated towards Steppenwolf. That something in there 
called out to me and I, I just I just you know uh, okay. absorbed it through osmosis you know <laughs> and and when I, finally, when I finally saw Steppenwolf on TV and I saw the bassist Nick St Nicholas I mean yeah some of the stuff the guy wore was a little bit left field uh -huh. but there were other times that he would be wearing like black leather pants and a buckskin fringe jacket you know yes and he's got his Rickenbacker or his EB3 you know Gibson EB3 I'm like, that's what I, that's what I want to do. I want to be a bass player. And that's kind of where it started. That's where it started. And how old would you say you were? Like 15, 14, 12? 13. 13. So, yeah, okay. Around the same time I was getting interested in playing. Okay, so that's how things started for you. So then when you got into your first band, what was it like a high school? You're playing in high schools like everybody pretty much does, that kind of thing? Or did you go into something bigger, like quicker? Which I've had that also told to me as well. Well, we, uh, in, in parochial school, uh, my my neighborhood chum, uh, my friend John Alton. Okay. Uh, he was a guitar he was a guitar player. You okay. Know, and and uh, he played lefty, so I couldn't play his guitar. <laughs> yep. Okay. But, uh, we we would always go down each other's basements and listen to records, you know. <laughs> yeah. And we listened to the uh, the Steppenwolf live album, where at the beginning it says "Greetings to you, friends of peace," you know, like that. Yeah. And I kind of borrowed that. We we put up we put our own little band together. Got and it. I came up with, I came up with the name it was called Phantasmagoria. <laughs> Phantasmagoria. Cool. And and we played at our parochial school. They had uh, some kind of talent show. Yes. And we got up there and and. Uh, um, uh, John played guitar. I forgot who played drums. There was a guy, somebody, I think I had tambourine. You know, and I got up on stage. I'm like, greetings to you, friends of peace. And the kids are like, what? You know? <laughs> wow. And we, we did, I don't know if we did an instrumental or something. We did some kind of song. And then, you know, it was the big, that was the first time I was ever on stage with, as you know, in the, in the capacity of being in a band. Then it was all over from there. <laughs> <laughs> it just it went south from there. Okay, so then we went from there. So things were like that, but then you got into an actual band that was had some credentials to it. Which band would you uh, say that would have been? Uh, not yet. We're almost we're almost there. Uh, I would. There were a lot of bands around the neighborhoods that would play it, like uh, out at, at parks or yep. at, at dances. Yep. You know, lot, lot of school dances, things like that. Yes. And and I would go stand there, and I would stand like right up front watching them, like kids do now at concerts. Yes. And I was watching their hands, watching what they're playing, you know, yeah. I was watching the instrumentation, the arrangements, things like that. Yep. And then when I when I got into high school, uh, I got on the dance committee. Okay. You know, I was I was on all these different committees and clubs and stuff, and and the dance committee brought me in contact closer to music. Uh, naturally, uh, the bands would show up. You know, we would uh, we, we would rearrange the cafeteria so that you know it was all walled off at the tables. Yeah. And we build a little build a little bit of a stage for them, and the band would show up, and I'd help them bring their gear in. I help them set it up. Okay. I'd watch the show, you know, the the dance, whatever. And at the end of the night, eleven o'clock, whatever, I'd help them pack down and pack their gear out. Okay. So there's like there's like the the uh, entry level roadie. Exactly. You started getting right. you started getting your chops, or well, not your chops. You started getting a little bit of a um, right. feet wet on that. Right. I wasn't I wasn't busy dancing. I was busy one. I was absorbing everything the bands were doing. You know. Very cool. So so you know, and I I kind of stuck out. But that's that's uh, using using it loosely in high school. I mean, I had like platform shoes and glitter on them. I was I was like <laughs> every you know I was like ahead of the curve in high school. Yeah. And around, you know, 1972, um, I became friends with with uh, you know uh, Peter Chris's family. Okay. Okay. And they they moved around the corner from me in Brooklyn, and I wound up dating one of his younger sisters. My friend John, I told you earlier, John dated one of the other sisters. Okay. And and Peter had just come out of a band called Chelsea. They they put out an album. They, they kind of broke up. And, and that's when Peter put the ad in, in the newspapers in New York looking for for the gig. Got it. Okay. So he, he would come over once in a while and visit his mom and dad there. Gave me my first rock and roll haircuts, cut them in layers, you know. Yeah. So he, he was like a big brother. You know, him and Lydia, Lydia and Chris used to put on little shows, uh, you know, in there. They didn't have a backyard. They had a roof okay. out their window. So it was like over a parking garage. Okay. And we'd hang out out there. And then um, when, when Peter got the gig, you know, at the end with with Peter uh, with Paul and Jean. Right. Then we were rehearsing three piece. Wow. And so he said, hey, "You want to come watch?" So yeah, we'd all pile in either the car or take the subway, 
to the to the famous loft on Twenty Third Street. Yep. And we watched them rehearse. They weren't kissed yet. No. See, they they they. Wow. I don't even think this is between Wicked Lester and Kiss. You know, they okay. were just they were out of Wicked, out of Wicked Lester, but not not quite Kiss. And we go watch them rehearse all the time. So I'm like. You know, I mean, I had a bass at this time. I, I, I got my first bass when I was 13 from my mother's uh, second husband when she got remarried. Okay. Uh, but, it, it could, you know, I, I would play down in the basement, but I, I had no formal musical education. Right. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. I'd listen to the records and try to copy what I was hearing. On the, I didn't know where A was. I didn't know where C was. I, you know, I didn't know the fretboard at all, you know, yeah. like that. So, I, so anyway, we're watching, the, you know, Peter and Gina Paul. And then uh, uh, we missed the auditions. Uh, and the next time we went up there, there's this guy leaning against the wall in a gray pinstripe suit with orange and purple sneakers. And, and, and that was Ace. And he's playing these ripping leads. Ace. He's already in the big He got the gig. Nice. Uh, and, and so now we were watching the four of them. And they still weren't yet Kiss. They still weren't Kiss. Wow. They were still looking, they were still looking for the name. And then, and then at some point afterwards, um, they came up with the name, and then their first makeup was more like the New York Dolls. Yeah. You know, and, and they, they perform at their loft and whatnot. And then, and then I, through them, I started to get to know more about the bands in Manhattan, in New York, you know, or the, the glam bands, the glitter bands. Like, yeah. there was a whole scene. Yes. You know, like that. And it was the Brats and the Planets and uh, Street Punk and, and Luger and, you know, all these bands that played in the club that I didn't know about until after I graduated in 74. Right. Uh, by 75, I was uh, I was working as a foot messenger in Manhattan. Okay. I was out, like, I was right off of 52nd and, and uh, Madison, in, in, in the Madison Avenue advertising area. Okay. So I worked for I worked for a, a company that did a lot of printing work for for newspaper ads. Oh, all right. So I was I was I was a foot messenger, and I had to go back and forth to all these different offices. Pick up their work, bring it to our place. They'd work on it uh, uh, on the negatives, and they'd bring it back. You know, oh, like that. So yeah. a few blocks away on Fifty Fifth Street was was a coin management. So you know, I that's where Kiss's management was. You know, uh, oh. and while I was, I'm going to jump back and forth here. While I was still in high school, we went to see Kiss play at the Diplomat, which is where Bill O'Coin saw them, and we convinced him to stay and see the band. Uh, wow. We, we saw we saw Kiss at the Coventry. And and recently we all saw the A and E bi a biography on Kiss. Yep. Right. So some of my pictures were used in that that biography. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, I got contacted by Kurt Gooch, who's a Kiss author, and they licensed four of my pictures from Kiss playing at the Coventry to be in the A and E biography, which is pretty cool, considering how I've been overlooked for decades by all of these other Kiss authors. I remember uh, you posting something about that. And I yeah. grabbed some of those pictures because I want to put it in the video. So we're going to let people see about that, if that's okay by you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the pictures from the Fillmore East show. Yeah. I have pictures from Coventry. You know, I was I was one of the only people who knew all of their cues when Gene was going to spit the fire, when this one was going to, you know. <laughs> wow. So I had, I had the pictures, to, you know, for that at that, that time. That's amazing. Um, so so anyway... Uh, but now we're getting to what you're asking me about my you know bands, first bands and stuff. Yep, yep. Um, so I, I'm sitting out in front of on Park Avenue, in front of the Seagrams building, and there's these two fountains. And this girl walks up, and she looks at me. She goes, "Hey, you have the same haircut I do." You know, it was all, all spiky. <laughs> yeah, spiky and layered, like you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well, we were all we were all copying. Uh, if you remember uh, the Rod Stewart, the Small Faces album, not as good as a wink for a blind horse. Uh huh. Okay. You look on the back; they had these rooster haircuts. Oh yeah, he was known for That's, that. Rod Stewart. Right. <laughs> they, they were one of the they were one of the first bands on the wave to do that, and all the New York bands were copying that. Oh, yep. Okay. That was that was done by Paul McGregor out of England. He was cutting all the rock stars with that layered haircut. Yep. And then he brought it to America, and he was cutting, you know, uh, uh, Warren Beatty, Jane Fonda. He was cutting the, the stars' hairs. That, that's how the layered haircut came into America. Okay. And wow. So anyway, so this girl says, uh, um, I go to Max's all the time. Have you ever been there? And I said, what's Max's? And she goes, you've never been to Max's, Kansas City? And I said, no, what is that? <laughs> she said, it's, 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 like the, it's like one of the top rock and roll clubs in New York. 
Wow. She goes, uh, meet, me, meet, me there, meet me there, and I'll, I'll show you the club. And so late, I think it was later that night or something, uh, I met her at the club, and it's like a, it's, it used to be at the very end of Park Avenue, right where it was starting, like 17th Street. Wow. In Manhattan. And, and it was a restaurant. But it started out as a club for, uh, besides a restaurant, for it was like an Andy Warhol art crowd. Oh, wow. You know, pool. Yeah, you know, hoity total art crowd people. Nice. And little by little, rock stars started to hang out there. Alice Cooper, Iggy Pop, David Bowie. Wow. These, they, were hanging out, they were hanging out there. And, and uh, Aerosmith got signed there. Alice Cooper got signed there. Frank Zappa hung out there. Wow. Uh, 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 Bruce Springsteen got signed there. Bob Marley got signed there. So this place was like a legend. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So here I'm walking in for the first time, and it's like shoulder to shoulder. Wow. You know, it was packed. It was always like that. And, you know, I got to meet the Ramones and Wayne County and Tough Darts and all the bands that were playing the Manhattan scene were hanging out there. How cool. You know? Yeah. So uh, so I, I got introduced to a, a local guitar player. Uh, his name nowadays he goes by Sebastian Black. He's like a, a, a magician, psychic medium kind of okay. like that in, in New York, out of the Bronx. And and uh, back then he was called Sebby Castle. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, he had a band called the Martian Rock Band. Martian Rock Band. <laughs> yeah, that's that's cool. And and he said, you know, uh, what do you do? I said, I'm a bass player. I said, I'm not I'm, I'm not that great, but I'm I'm a bass player. And, he goes, well, we're, we're looking for a new bass player. And he goes, you got this. Th this is the beginning of, you know, you got this look thing going on. Yep. I, I found through the rest of my career getting brought into various bands because of my look. Yeah. You know, I had something to bring to the table visually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That so, was big. So, yeah, we, we got to talking and, and he had me uh, uh, come up to his, his the rehearsal loft. Okay. Okay. Manhattan had many different uh, um, office buildings that had lofts in them. They were industrial buildings, you know. Right. Yeah. Had some sewing sewing centers, things like that, and they were they were abandoned and used as rehearsal lofts for bands. Okay. And on on, on East on uh, was it East West West Thirtieth Street? I think it was two fifty West Thirtieth Street. It was a famous building. All these bands rehearsed in there. Okay. So I think we're up on the, we're up on the seventh floor, and and you know it's maybe uh, I don't know. 20, 30 feet wide by about uh, 12 feet deep. Okay. It's pretty pretty small. Yeah. And, you know, you have your gear set up on one end of the room like that. And, and yeah. uh, I met the, the drummer at that time he, that he had. We replaced him. But, you know, and he was showing me the songs. Okay. And, and, he was, and you know, and, and God bless him. He had so much patience with me. The stuff was really easy. It was really entry-level stuff. Okay. You know, uh, some of it was kind of like... Uh, amped up doo wop kind of fifty stuff and oh, okay and, and and space stuff and punk we was we had a little fringe of punk in what we were doing. Uh, Sebi called it spunk music, so um, <laughs> okay like that. Uh, you know, it was take me to your leader, uh, Mister Mister Lady and Mrs Man, uh, greatest magician in the galaxy. Uh, you know, just really oddball titles. Sounds like Bowie influenced to me, like David uh, Bowie influenced I, type. Maybe a little bit in, in what became my look, mm -hmm. uh, because you know they didn't really have a stage image. I saw them do one show before I joined. Okay. And, and Sebastian wore a, a purple jumpsuit. He had this huge silver box in the corner of the stage that he would come out of. <laughs> you know, that had you know lights on it and stuff. It looked yeah. like an oversized refrigerator. He That's would come out of that. Funny. And that was pretty much the show. And and he had there was a guy that was a friend of the band. This guy Peter. He didn't really play anything, but he would walk around on stage with his black cape and a, and, a, and a metallic robot mask over his head, and he'd swing a medieval chain, a ball of chain, you know, with spikes on it. Wow. And it was, that was just, that was their theater. Okay. And, and uh, I was, I, you know, I'm, I'm scrambling, I'm trying to look at who can I be in this band? What identity can I create for me? Gotcha. Now that okay. I, I got the gig with this band. Yeah. And in the song, Take Me to Your Leader, you know, we'll, we'll play like a blah, 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 and it stop, and he'll just say, the drummer is from this planet. And, okay. and we'll get in on that and stop. We go, the bass player, he's from Mercury. Da, 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 and I'm the greatest magician in the galaxy. Like it. So, okay, I'm, now I'm established as coming from Mercury. I see. Great. 
desert planet. It's not Dune. It's hotter. Okay. <laughs> so who can it be? <laughs> and and my favorite monster, my favorite Universal monster, was the creature from the Black Lagoon. Okay. And I know that in the hot climates on Earth, lizards live. Some lizards species live in hot climates. Yep. The stretchy black spandex bodysuit. I put rhinestones all over it, like shooting stars. I copied Ace Fraley's outfit from a lot. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Where I got these, these little shooting stars of rhinestones and things like that all over it. And um, I went out and got a pair of silver platform boots that looked like something out of rollerball and these, these pyramid cold <laughs> studs. And it, it, looked like, it looked like Ace's boots, but shorter. Right, 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 right. That's and, crazy. The boots on, on the cover of Alive, it's those little silver boots. Yep, yep, I know exactly then, which ones, yep. And then, so I took a black eyeliner pencil, and everywhere my skin was exposed, I drew scales. From, oh, wow. From where it opened up at my navel, all the way up to here, and I drew these scales. Okay. All right, now I got scales, and then um, I covered my eyebrows in dermal wax, and, I, and like up in here, the shadow, I did frosted blue. <laughs> so it looked like, looked like Spock. <laughs> okay. And then, you know, I tease, tease the hair out and I got silver streaking tips and I go and hit a, hit a spray of silver right. in the hair. Okay. And then, all right, well, and it's like now I'm a cross between Gene and Ace. Okay. If you could, if you could mold, morph those two together. Y yeah. Gene's I'm Gene's visually seeing what you're telling me. <laughs> right now. And I'm in, my, I'm in my basement. I'm sitting there looking in the mirror. I'm trying to put this thing together and then if Gene spits blood so he's got red uh -huh. I'm supposed to be from some other place uh, you know in space right. so I took green food coloring All right. I put a couple of drops of green on my tongue <laughs> the whole the whole inside of my mouth is now green oh wow and I'm doing the whole Gene thing ah. that's great like that with, with green yeah. and, and, and on stage Sebastian he had a flying V and he added two extra wings on the V. So you have this and this, uh -huh. and then down here, two, two more. He oh, put them on the okay. He had like a, a sixth wing V. Interesting. Wow. And it was all, it was all silver. Okay. okay? And, and, uh, and he would shoot fire out of the end of his, his headstock. <laughs> Holy shit. Wow. He, he, knew, he knew where all the magic shops were on, around Times Square. Okay. So I said, "How do you do? How do you do that?" And he showed me. And it was a thing called Dragon's Breath. Wow. And it's it's a, it's a powder. It's it's if you lay it on a table in a pile, you throw a match on it, nothing will happen. Okay. It has to be aerated in the air. Oh. And he would. It comes with a little squeeze bottle, like a nasal spray squeeze bottle. Yeah. With a little with a tube inside that would come all the way out, and when you squeeze that bottle and you shoot the powder in the air. I'm revealing magic tricks here. <laughs> you are. But when you shoot this powder and you light it with a, with a source, like a match or a lighter, yeah. it turns into this flamethrower. Wow, that's neat. Very so, cool. So, so he did that, and I tried to run him one better. You know, friendly competition. Oh. Um, my, one of my other uh, uh, comic book uh, uh, favorites was Spider-Man. Okay. Now, if you remember, Spider-Man would go like this in his palms yes. and shoot the webbing out of his wrist. Yep, of course. So yeah. here's me going, okay, now how do I do this? All right, I know how it works. So I got a cocktail straw, so I, I, I lengthened the straw out of the squeeze bottle. And I got a pair of silver lemme gloves. <laughs> and I, I secreted the squeeze bottle under the glove. Oh, wow. And I ran, I ran the tube up to the tip of my finger. Wow. And on my, my amp, I had SVT. I, on the other side, I had candles. Nice. So, then, okay, so now how do I get the flame to go from back there to out here? Well, there's another magic trick called uh, um, flash paper. Uh-huh. And it's real thin, like onion skin. You can almost see through it. Okay. It comes in a little, pa it comes in a little pad. You tear off the sheets as you as you need them. Right. And magicians, you, you see them go like this with their hand. Yeah. And it'd yep, be yep. a flip. A fluff of flame out of their hand. Okay, gotcha. That's what that's what flash paper is. Neat. So I would take the flash paper in my right hand, ignite it from behind me, from the amp, and the time it took me to go over here to in front of me, 
and then I would squeeze the in my hand like this. So it looks like it come out of your that, hand. That was my that was my ignition source, and I would shoot fire out of my finger. That's so cool, man. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to come back with Rick Fox and talk about these other bands he got into. Sin, Steel, many other ones, including Wasp in the very beginning stages right after that. way more that we could talk about but we have so much time so Rick, let's talk Rick now about you know with Blackie Lawless and how from there you you did some demo with him I think a couple songs and then a couple of them ended up on the first Wasp album I believe is that right well what happened was uh, he, he flew me out to California okay I brought my I brought my bass a bass head uh, I tore up my couch to use the foam to wrap the bass head in <laughs> <laughs> so rock and, and roll, I love it. And, and, yeah, rock and roll stories. And, yeah. and some, you know, just some clothes, a little bit of clothes. Yep. So we, we get picked up at the airport by Blackie and Randy and Tony and this guy who was driving them, Mike Solon. Okay. Well, Mike Solon is the guy who plays the bartender in Blind in Texas in the video. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, Mike Solon. His brother, Eddie Solon, was Ace Frehley's guitar tech and their sound man early wow. on. Wow. There's another degree of connections. Yes. Like that. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So Mikey's car wasn't running, so Mike used to drive us everywhere. Okay. Okay. And, and we, you know, we go down to Randy's studio in Buena Park, uh, just spitting distance from Disneyland, and and uh, and we were her again in an industrial room, nice. the building, and. and Several bands rehearsed there. Right. Uh, uh, Exciter with George Lynch and Mick Brown. I remember Exciter. Yep. Right. Uh, and, and we rehearsed at the back of the room and like that. Anyway, so I sit down, and, and, and this is like after two minutes, the jet lag wears off. Yeah. Blocky took, Blocky took me out to the clubs. I had my first trip to the Troubadour. David Lee Roth. Wow. Uh, uh -huh. Later on, we go up to the Rainbow. We sit down at a table. Who comes over to sit with us? David Lee Roth. And I'm going, uh -huh. Pinch me, you know. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, so they brought the city at our table my first night in Hollywood, you know. Pretty awesome. Uh, and we saw, saw Punky Meadows there and Michael Diamond from Mike's Diamond, like that. Like, what are you doing out here, you know? Yeah. Um, anyway, so after the jet lag wears off, uh, we finally get down to business and I sit down and they go through the set, like mm -hmm. five songs. Yep. Uh, 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 on Your Knees, Hellion. Uh, Sleeping in the Fire, yep. B.A.D., mm -hmm. and I think what they say, School Days? School Days. It's like five songs. I watched them run through it twice. Okay. Now, in my mind, I'm reaching back to the to the loft watching Kiss. Yeah. And it's there's like a direct connection. <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm, I'm, with, with Kiss, I'm this kid in high school watching this band thundering in front of me. Right. Playing something I've never heard before. Right. Yep. Cut to 1982, February, I'm sitting in California watching this band thundering in front of me playing something I've never heard before. Right. Same thing. Only now I have an opportunity to get in, in, it, in it and play with it. That's the, the big difference. <laughs> yeah. So they went through the song t twice. Okay. I get up and they should kind of get an idea how the songs go. And they're real easy stuff. Yeah. You know, you, you can you know from the first album. Yep. And, and I, I took them. Two days to audition for them to figure it out. After the second day, they went, all right, you got the gig. You're in the band. Okay. Like that, you know. And then, so I was under Blackie's wing the whole time, pretty much. All right. I stayed in his, at his rental cottage in Hollywood. Okay. The guy was starving. Uh, uh, you know, when it came time to pay the bills, when they, they you know, the guys would come to, to do read the meter. Yeah. He would unscrew the meter, he, 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 and he would set the dials back. <laughs> And then put the meter back together so it looked like nobody was living there. Oh, my God, man. I'm not going to so say. I know somebody did that, too. <laughs> he, well, in, in his library, oh. Blackie had, among, amongst the books about Nazis and how to, how to 
uh, uh, change people's minds about things. Okay. Uh, he had this book by Abby Hoffman called "Steal This Book." Right. And it was all this this anarchist uh, against the against the uh, uh, right. You know how to counterculture stuff and how yeah. to get away with things. Yeah. And one of the things he learned in there was how to do this. This is before they used to put that little band that would seal the glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, and he it made it look like there was nobody living there, so he'd have to pay the bills. Yep, I got it. Until okay. they got hip to it, and they put the locking band, the collar on it. So now, Rick, how long were you in with, with him with this? Until just a demo was created? Okay, so that, that's February, March. Uh, by, by April, we had recorded a demo. Okay. And, and uh, he had something he had finished, put together, was, which became Master of Disaster. Okay. And I, I wrote like the second verse and, and the breakdown part before the solo. Okay. And then we had six songs right. and we recorded them on a live uh, three track demo. I don't know how that works, but there was no, no overdubs. Gotcha. Okay. And so Blackie was listening back to the demo and he looks at me and he goes, he goes, I'm really happy. This is working out fine. This is great. Okay. Okay. He calls Don Atkins, who was a photographer in, in LA at the time, shot Motley Crue's first pictures and. All these other bands, Starwood, you know, like uh, Starwood just closed right before I got there. Mm. So I missed the whole Starwood scene. Mm. So Don, we go to Don's parents' house and we take pictures, band, band photos like that, right. uh, photo session. And then, uh, uh, you know, we got some some printed things like that. And then yeah. uh, somewhere around like in right in the middle of May, mm -hmm. he stops talking to me. Wow. You know, like just cold. Just not, if, if he doesn't have to talk to me, he won't say anything. It was like really awkward being in that same space. Mm. And, and I didn't know what happened. And then I, I have the words, I put two and two together. But I, I put, he says, he goes, you know what, we got to talk. Okay. All right, what happened? He says, uh, it's not working out. Oh, now, Tony's okay. not happy, Randy's not happy. Uh, yes. You know, and, and you, you're going to have to work, you're going to have to get somebody else. You're out of the band. Steeler. How Steeler got right. into play so, here? So, uh, it's got to be a couple of dots to connect here. I'm trying to do this real quick. Um, sure. Steeler was playing the Roxy, and uh, they had already been established for about a year in L.A. They were one of the, like, the top bands already in L.A. Yeah. And I had never, I'd never seen them, but they were playing the Roxy. So, I met my friend at the time, uh, uh, Eric Carr, who was the drummer in Kiss. Yeah. Wow. Uh, we're hanging. We're hanging out the Roxy. We're watching Steeler. We're, Ron's hitting those those high screams and everything. I was like, "Holy cow!" I mean, this guy is like at, at the top of the fringe of like, ah, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, they were they were they were really good. They came on, boom. I mean, just in your face. Wow. Uh, they, they were all good musicians. Okay, they were, they were good performers, technically. But Ron was the guy that stood out. He was like, I said, this guy's going to be a rock star. Yeah. Okay? He's, he's, he's got what it takes to be the rock star. Nice. The other guys were behind that. You know, they weren't like on the same level visually as him. Wow. 
Wow. So, so you know, and like that I'm saying, not to take anything from them musically, they were they were right on the money musically, but they, they had no image like him. Yep. And yes. and I didn't had I didn't know that at that point that they had already uh, uh, did showcases for every major label in town and got turned down. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So so, uh, so I'm there with Eric watching the band. Uh, long story short, too late. Uh, there's too many facts. Uh, I, I had put an ad in Music Connection magazine. Uh, you know, bass player from New York. Uh, I was affiliated with Kiss. I, I worked with Thor. There's another one we forgot. I worked with Thor like that. There was no internet, so it was only word of mouth. You could only tell people what you did. You're right. You know. Yeah. So, so I got I got contacted by Ron Keel. Right. Okay. And and uh, he says meet meet me at. What you know became the Steeler Mansion, which was like an inside joke because it was it was three gutted storefronts that were encrusted with roaches. Oh my okay? god! It was like poverty on steroids. <laughs> um, so so I walk in, and and Ron's you know we go into the rehearsal room. It's the drum riser, and that's it. And I say, "Where's the band? Where's where's the gear?" Mm -hmm. He says, "Hey man, I fired everybody." I said, Why? the band I just saw at the Roxy, you said you fired the whole bit. Yeah, man. I said, you took a big leap of faith, you know. Uh, uh, he says, well, we can only get to a certain level. I need to get beyond that level. Yeah. And I couldn't get there with, with the band that I had, that lineup. Yeah. Oh, wow. So he said, you know, I, I need a band that looks like we're already signed. We're like seasoned veterans, been on the road touring. That's the kind of band I need. Oh wow! And you got, your your name got mentioned to me. We saw your ad, and people talked around town about your look. There's there's the look again. And uh, so I didn't rep I didn't replace Tim Morrison directly because the whole band was getting replaced. Uh, but Ron had already replaced the drummer Bobby Eva. Mark Edwards was now in the band. Okay. That was the new drummer. Uh, and and that became his business partner in there. Um, so. He gave me a cassette tape. He says, learn these songs. No promises. We'll mm -hmm. talk from there. Okay. I took the cassette. I learned the songs. I wish I still had that cassette. I don't know what happened to it. I learned the songs. I went back. It's just Ron and I, one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. You know, he's, he's on the drum riser sitting there. I'm on the chair, and we're playing across from each other. And like, like we're doing now, swapping stories. We talked about Kiss, and Ron's a big Kiss fan. Right. And I said, well, I knew Sean Delaney, who taught Kiss, all of their choreography and their moves and wow. like that. And I gave him a little bit of my background from New York, like that. And and uh, so we just were rehearsing that way, just one-on-one. -on -one. And then Mark came back. Mark was out in Texas. He came back from Texas. Right. Now the three, of, the three of us are rehearsing together. It's a three-piece, just like, like Kiss did before they were Kiss. Right, right. And we're just getting tight, getting tight, getting tight. And and this is where Mark and I, I, I this is the first time I really had to sit down with a, with a professional, uh, uh, you know, amazing drummer and learn about what makes a rhythm section a rhythm section. Okay. You know, all these years I'm playing somebody else's material, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it didn't matter because I'm just playing stuff off the records. I mean, it mattered, you know, but I, you know, we never talked in cover bands about getting tight with the drummer. Right. You know, right. You just played your part. Everybody played their parts. So Mark taught me about, you know, here's ahead of the beat. Here's behind the beat. Lay back. Step up. You know, and, and what to, to listen for when you're working with a drummer. Listen to that kick. Listen to what he's doing with that. Kick. He helped you develop your yeah. chops, basically. More yeah. Chops. And so Mark and I would rehearse for like an hour or two, just bass and drums alone. Right. To get tight. Yep. Okay. Then we take we take a break. We go sit outside uh, in the other room. Again, like you know, we were starving, we didn't really have much to eat. We were eating like top ramen. Okay, oh, uh, Ron, Ron Ron kept the road crew, and we learned so many different ways about how to eat top ramen from from right. Jimmy and Alan. So <laughs> so what happened with this band? How Ingve got involved with Steeler? Was he already in it? This is the new version you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so when Ron felt comfortable that we were good as a trio. Okay. He was already in touch with Mike Varney. And Varney had a column in the guitar magazine, guitar player, whatever. And he was showcasing all these up and coming guitar players. Gotcha. Okay. So Ron, Ron had already been to Mike Varney's house and Varney gave him a bunch of cassette tapes to listen to. 
Okay. Uh, you know, and in, he, he, we, he picked out Ingve and, and one other guy, and we listened to Ingve. It was like, holy cow, it's like Eddie Van Halen on, you know, on acid. Yeah. You know, and it was, we never heard anything like that before. So no? uh, we got a we, we got a conference call, three way conference call with Ingve and Barty and us. And Ingve was like, yeah, man, I want to come to California. I want to come be in your band. I want to play with you guys. Blah blah blah. He was like fired up. He was motivated. Right. Yep. And that was impressive. You know, the guy really wanted to be here and be, be, be in our band. I went, okay. Oh. So uh, arrangements were made uh, to fly him to the United States. Right. And and we went to the airport to go pick him up almost a year to the day from when I first arrived for Wash. It was February 4th, 1982. By, by December of 1983, my birthday at the Rainbow, Ron goes, you got the gig. You're in Steeler. Wow. By February of 1983, we went to pick up Ingray from the airport on almost the same day. Wow. How weird, how weird is that? That's amazing. And, it's meant and to happen, he, yeah. He, he comes down the ramp, you know, like this, flipping his hair. And, yeah. You know, the Viking has arrived. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And something must have happened between the guy we talked to on the phone and the guy that were coming down the ramp. Huh. It wasn't like the same guy. This okay. was like, this was 19 year old piss and vinegar attitude. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I think he was trying to impress us. You know, I don't know. Maybe because he's uh, younger. You know, he's, wearing, he's got a pentagram and he's into black magic and UFO and the paranormal and, you know, uh, all, all of this. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I got gotcha. you. Know. Okay, so let's so uh, anyway, look at some of what's behind you there about Steeler. And that says it right there, what you've done with this band. Like, I see a bunch of Steeler stuff on the wall, which is really cool. And yeah. something with Wasp, right? It looks yeah. like before uh, the Wasp. Let me see if we can move the phone up. Pretty cool, uh, right? Right there. Yeah. There's Blackie. That's the Wasp. That's that's the Wasp picture. Yeah. That's me, Blackie, Tony, and Randy. Nice. Uh, that's the Steeler. Yep. Steeler. Yep. Uh, uh, if you can see that, St uh, Steeler and Hip Parader magazine. Yeah. And Sin? Uh, that's, that's the Sin, the, the first picture disc single with the first lineup of Sin. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. That's the second lineup of Sin. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's some pictures of me on stage with Ronnie Dio. Ah, oh, rest in peace, Ronnie, man. There's, there's Taylor like that. You know, yeah, there's, there's, there's Thunderball. Oh, well. Very yeah, cool. so uh, sur surgical steel. Yep, yep. Yeah. Very cool so, stuff. And then so, I see you got an arsenal of bases behind you that are awesome. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the blood base, I don't know if you can see it. There we are. Yeah, there That's you go. That's my perfect. army approach my blood base. Nice. I got a 1975, I don't know if you can see it, 1975 Gibson EB3. Yeah, very nice. That's my uh, my uh, uh, BC Rich custom Warlock, Warlock with every yep. color in the world on it. I see it. Rainbow. <laughs> yeah. Thunderbird. And uh, there's, there's, that's my, my primary base, my... Uh, my uh, Epiphone, my yeah. White Thunderbird. Yeah. And then I got my, my tobacco one over here next to it. Beautiful, man. Very awesome. So cool, yeah. man. Okay, so so Inve, Inve, you know, the band's form with Steeler. Things go pretty well with that. Now, let's move a little bit into the future here. And I want to go back and talk about somebody that we all know, that we had opportunity to connect with, and that's the most amazing photographer, what a nice guy he is, Mark Weiss that you're connected Likewise. with. And of course, you want to talk about Jeff Labar, rest in peace, that just passed uh, a very big Philadelphia hometown rock star hero here. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about those few things. Well, uh, I met Mark Weiss in the 70s when we were going to the, the, the uh, rock conventions in New York and Manhattan. Nice. And he was a budding up-and-coming up photographer. Mm -hmm. uh, he started getting his first assignments from Circus Magazine, which I used to go visit to get the, you know, when I was a, uh, a messenger in Manhattan. Nice. That's where I met Ger Gerald Rothberg, who was the editor. He's, he's, we're friends on Facebook, you know, right. all these years later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and like that, and, you know, a lot of photographers would shoot concerts in, in the surrounding tri-state area. Right. And then we have these rock, rock and roll conventions 
uh, and everybody had their table and they're selling pictures of you know and whatnot like that. Yeah, just like uh, we're Richie still doing. Rino from, Richie, Richie Rhino from Stars had a table and he was selling stuff. You know, nice. so that, that's kind of you know where I hung out with Mark and, and we were part of this little clique back there in Manhattan at, at that point. Very awesome. Yeah. And then you have an and interesting then, uh, story about Cinderella. With Fred, right? It was a Fred Quarry? Right. right. It's a uh, cool uh, story. Well, when I had Sin, and I had my apartment in Hollywood uh, in, in um, like 84, 83, 84, uh, okay. uh, Fred, was, Fred was playing drums in a band called London. Yep. Heard uh, on. With Nader Dupree. Everybody played in London except me. A lot of guys from Guns <laughs> N' Roses. It was, the, it was like the turnstile band. Everybody would go to London and then go we'll move on to something else. Yeah, it seemed that <laughs> way. Yeah. Maybe I should have been in London. I might be bigger today. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but Fred, Fred came over to my apartment, and we were listening to uh, my Sin stuff, my demos and, and whatnot, uh, things we had done. And Fred wanted to join Sin. Okay. And then, and then he had gone back to uh, uh, I don't know Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, wherever he was he was living at. Right. And then when he came back again, and he came over, he said, "Hey, listen." He goes, "I really want to be in, in Sin." But I got an offer from this other band. I want, I'm going to join. It called Cinderella, and I went, Cinderella. What the hell, what the hell kind of name is that for a band, Cinderella? <laughs> well, you know, prove me wrong. Yeah, <laughs> they got did. big, huge. Yeah. So, so Fred got the gang. He was with Cinderella, and you know, uh, uh, I was also there, well. There was a, one of the tours. They the first tours they did. Uh, they were supporting Loudness. Oh, I love Loudness, dude. Kira yeah. Takis. So, so uh, Loudness became friends of mine. Their tour manager gave me some laminates, nice. and that tour was Cinderella and Poison flip flopping over open and support, open and support. You know, one city would be Cinderella open and Poison in the middle. Yeah. Loudness headline. Next city would be Poison open, Cinderella in the middle, and Loud Loudness headline. So you know, so I I got to kind of you know I know the guys at Poison yeah. already. They had moved into the Steeler Mansion when we all moved out. Really? <laughs> so Bobby, Doll, Bobby, Bobby Doll had my old room, and he goes, it was the best room in the place. I said, that's because I decorated it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, so I, I got to meet, you know, Fred, you know, Cinderella guys. But one of their later tours, they were coming through town, and uh, uh, Fred calls me up. He says, Jeff wants to talk to you. I said, all right. He puts Jeff on the phone. Jeff goes, look, everybody in town is bugging Fred for tickets and passes. He's popular. Everybody knows Fred. Yeah. He goes, I don't know anybody. Uh, you want to be my guest? That's so Jeff like, Labar. Wait, you, want wow. you want me to be your girlfriend, too? <laughs> That's really cool. You know, you know, Jeff, of all the people he could have called, he says, he says, you want to be my guest. So that was that was really, you know, very generous and, and of him, and, and, and it was you know, uh, humbling for me. And, and, and it's, yeah, he said, made arrangements and, and I got to, you know, the show and, and wow. taste the ticket. There's the backstage passes. Come on, hang out with us on the bus. Wow. You know, Tom Kiefer. I said, hi, how you doing to Kiefer? That was all, that was, you know, like that to Tom. Yeah. And that was Jeff's guest, you know, and, and that was, that's my Jeff Labar story. We've been friends ever since. Amazing. And, and Jeff, Jeff was also like a, a chef. He would cook, he cooked stuff. Yeah. And, and he, and he showed on Facebook, you know, his 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 uh, creations. Yes. I'm also a chef. Really? So I cook. Okay. So we we there's something else we're connecting on. Very cool. Is that you know we're both rock and roll cooks. Nice. See? Nice. All right, I'll yeah, tell you and, what. Uh, uh, Ron, Ron Ron Keel and I got some of our recipes in a book called. Uh, it's it's about uh, it's a rock and roll recipes for autism. Oh. And 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 Kenny Wilkerson. From Nova Rex in Florida, put this book together. Okay. And and all these rock stars got their recipes. In oh, this that's book. cool. So Ron's got his chili in there. I've got my cancer fighting suit, uh, like oh, that. Wow. And and so yeah, yeah. So you know, like I said, Jeff and I were both you know chefs. Okay, so we're gonna come back in just a minute and talk about Ron Keel and how there could be a new connection of a new album that Rick may be involved with. Actually, a single All right, this is Mark and I'm back with Rick Fox, and we're going to finish up our show today. Man, there's so many awesome things we talked about, and now we're going to talk about the possibility of you reconnecting 
even though you're still connected with Ron Keel, you're still with Connection, you even played some stage things and shows with him, but now there's a possibility Steeler could be putting out another album, and you might be involved with playing bass with Ron again on this new Steeler album. Is that is that the truth on that? Uh, you know, I don't know all the facts. I don't know all the facts yet. Uh, we did the we did the Steeler reunion. The, the reunion that people said would never happen, we shut them all down, and we did a Steeler reunion with Mitch Perry uh, in, in Columbus, Ohio, at the El Rosa Villa Club. Nice. And 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 we, you know, some of it's on YouTube. The rest of it's on Ron's Patreon channel. Okay. And and that showed that showed that the magic is still there. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we, we went into rehearse, Mitch hadn't played the Steeler material in decades. Right. We walked in. We walked in the room, and we went through the set the first time. Ron turned around and looked at us. He said, "Boys, I'll see you in Ohio." You know. <laughs> like that. Never left and, and so 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 wow. that that worked. And now, you know, Ron and I have subsequently jammed occasionally here and there. Uh, we just moved to Missouri. They just played up in Kansas City. The Ron Keel band played in Kansas City. Yeah. With uh, Jack Russell's Great White. Nice. Who we're friends with. And and uh, he had me come up there, and I got on stage, and we did Cold Day in Hell, and that went off really well. The yeah. fans loved it. I saw the video. Uh, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So uh, uh, Ron had just put something out recently in a press release uh, announcing some of his upcoming projects. He's got a, a Black Sabbath thing because he did some some work with Black Sabbath briefly. Really? Um, cool. And then he mentioned that uh, there's going to be, you know, uh, some Steeler, new Steeler material in the works. So I'm pretty wow. excited about that. I don't, I don't know what it consists of yet. Uh, it's, it's to be announced. It's to be, you know, when Ron's ready to tell me, Ron just picks up the phone and says, all right, here's what I'm doing, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, yeah, like that. And, yeah, and that's yeah. that's kind of how we do it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and Ron Ron is going to be at the upcoming Rock and Pod convention in Nashville next weekend. Nice. And I'm going to do this. He's, been a, he's a veteran at the Rock and Pod. He's been here many times. This is my first time there. Wow, cool. So, you know, uh, you know uh, Chris Chinshack and Aaron and Ron, all these guys who put together the, the Decibel Geek podcast uh they, they say come on out rick this will be your first year there and it's like billy sheehan's going to be playing Vinny apathy carmine apathy ace von, von johnson all uh, uh this all these rock stars playing there these a-list people so wow. uh, on friday night at the mercy lounge uh we're going to have a, an all-star jam and ron's going to play wow uh, uh tommy skewich from from uh, tesla he's got his new band there and they're going to be playing nice uh you know like that and then like from I think nine nine thirty on, it's gonna be all these rock stars. We're all gonna get up there, and we're doing a Kiss song. We're doing Cold Gin. Nice. Uh, we're doing Right to Rock. Nice. Rock Hill song. Yeah. And we're doing Cold. We're doing Cold Day and Hill, Steelers song. So it's, it's a lot of lot of rock personages all in this room, and and we're all That's looking so cool. forward to it. You know, we're going we're going on right after Billy Sheehan. Billy Sheehan's playing with Greg Bissonette. Wow, so cool, man. We're doing, doing some doing some David Lee Roth stuff. So. Right after they go off, we go on, you know, which is a great follow. Yeah. So we're all friends. We all know each other. You know, and then Saturday, there's all these different rock and pod table casts, you know. Neat. And, and then uh, I have an autograph and a signing and a photo session right next to Ace Von Johnson. So we're going to be together at the same table. Very cool. Like that. Very cool. So, yeah, we've got all this cool stuff coming up. So uh, the rest remains to be seen, you know. Well, I'll tell you what, man. I'm going to end the show with one last thing, and it's how you got your title as the heavy metal winged knight, right? Is I saying oh. that right? How did that happen? <laughs> Th thanks for asking. I forgot about that. Uh, that's my that's my Polish ancestry. Uh, we have in our our ancestry uh, these legendary cavalry knights from Poland in the 17th century. Wow! Uh, they wore armor. They wore armor from their waist up. You know. Yeah. And on their backs, uh, they well, some of them had them on the saddles, and then some of them later on had them on their backs. They looked like two hockey sticks. Oh, you know, okay. With feathers, cool, man. Like that, and, and then, uh, uh, they would charge into battle, and it would look like there's thousands more than there were. They looked like God's angels coming out of heaven. Wow. And they had they had lances that were like eighteen feet long with these eight foot eight foot pennants that would flutter. It would tear the hell, scare the hell out of the enemy's horses. Wow. Okay. And, okay. And they were the they were the winged knights of of Poland. The wing they were called winged hussars. Wow. And I I took this upon myself to to recreate this when I took some time off of rock 
to do living history, nice. like at Renaissance fairs, things yeah. like that, military timeline. And and I presented this to America for the first time. That's cool. And and yeah, and and so I I said, well, certain guys in the biz in the business find some kind of tagline, something that people can latch onto and identify with who they are. And since Ronnie, I, you know, I, I I was on stage with Ronnie Dio a couple of times, and Ronnie's a lot of his videos are into like you know the the sword, the sorcery, and the knights, oh, and, yeah. and you know, like that, and like that. So Ronnie and I were kind of like kindred spirits about that. He liked medieval stuff. Yeah. Okay. And and the, the way new swords were after medieval, they were like Renaissance era. Yeah. Okay. But people people see armor and they think, oh, it's you know a uh, medieval. It's not. It's it's Renaissance era, okay. but that's how I became the winged knight of heavy metal because that's my ancestry. That's I was so trying awesome. to find a way to bring, to bring my Polish ancestry into what I'm doing musically. That's amazing. See, but that's, so that's amazing. how I became the winged knight of heavy metal. I love it. That's such a cool story. And I'll tell you what, I want to say thank you, Rick, for coming to the show. I know there's way more we could probably talk about. Maybe another time we can have you come back. Uh, it was an interesting interview with you today. I appreciate your time. I'm going to say I'm Marky Z, my partner. Ryan. Well, Rick, welcome back. It's yeah. great to see you. Thanks for being here. What are some of your best memories of our time in 1983? What were some of the, the things that really stand out to you that, that really made a difference in our lives and our careers? And the recording of the album or shows? Or, I know we played some big shows. As long-winded as I am, do we have time for all that? No. Oh, no, your mic's off, so you're cool. <laughs> yeah. oh, you, can use, you can use the man microphone here. Okay, that's it. I hear you. <laughs> Follow Rick Fox on Facebook, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I love this guy, and we've been talking about this since about 2013, when the 30th anniversary of the Steeler album happened. And I thought we should probably get back on the horse and ride it one more time. And tonight's the night. We're here in Columbus, Ohio. Right?